Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to my video presentation. First of all, let me introduce you to my topic, which is archaeochemistry. Now I will move towards my introduction. My name is Tuban Iman and I am a student of the Department of PS Biochemistry. Now I will be sharing the content included in this presentation with you. It includes an introduction to archaeochemistry as well as the aims, purpose, importance and scope of this subject. It also includes the analytical techniques used in archaeochemistry as well as the materials which are studied under this subject. I will also be talking about the chemical analysis of artifacts. Artifacts are actually archaeological materials which are discovered by archaeologists. I would then move towards the identification of manufacturing techniques of artifacts and I would also share some successful identifications of ancient technologies. I would also be talking about the use of chemistry in the preservation and conservation of important artifacts and archaeological sites which is actually so important to conserve uh, the human history for the coming generations. Then I would be sharing some case studies surrounding advancements of archaeochemistry and then in the end I would be talking about challenges and opportunities in this field. Let me start with an introduction. Archaeochemistry, as the name shows, is an interdisciplinary field of science. It combines archaeology and chemistry. As we know, archaeology is a study of ancient materials while chemistry is a study that lets us know about elements and their interaction. This subject actually analyzes and interprets chemical components and processes which are related to archaeological materials. Now I will be talking about the aims of archaeochemistry. It is very important to understand the composition of ancient materials, to know their structure and properties and how they could have been made, and to know the transformation they must have undergone with the passage of time. Now I would move towards the purpose. Archaeochemistry gives us an insight into the technologies of ancient societies and it also lets us know about the production methods and gives us hints about their trade networks. It can also give us clues about the cultural practices of the ancient world. Now let me talk about its importance. It is an important subject because it contributes to our understanding of human history and the ancient world and the combination of archaeological, historical and chemical data gives us great insights in the technological advancements, cultural interactions and environmental changes through time. Studying these processes also allows the development of great preservation methods so that our artifacts and archaeological sites can be conserved. Now I will be talking about the scope of archaeochemistry. Its scope is interdisciplinary as it involves collaborations with different specialists. Let me introduce you to some different key areas of this subject. Bioarchaeology actually involves analysis of biological materials. Second comes dating methods. Different dating techniques like radiocarbon dating rely upon the chemical analysis of samples. The third one is residue analysis. It involves the study of residues with certain techniques like microscopy, chromatography, and mass spectrometry. It also gives us insights into food preparation, consumption, trade patterns, and the usage of natural resources. The next one is material analysis, in which materials like glass, ceramics, metals, resins, pigments, and organic remains are studied thoroughly to understand their composition and their technological and cultural usage and importance. Now I will be talking about the analytical techniques in archaeochemistry. First of all, let me tell you what an analytical technique is. It is basically a method or approach which is used to analyze or interpret data or information so that we can have insights and we can make important conclusions and decisions based on the data or information gathered through the experiments. The first analytical technique is spectroscopy. In spectroscopy, interaction of material and electromagnetic radiation is involved and it lets us know about the chemical composition of a sample. It provides us with great detailed information about the composition and the structure of a sample which is being observed. Its working principle is that each element in the product table has a unique light spectrum which enables the analysis of any sample which is being observed. Now let me talk about the procedure of spectroscopy. The process starts with the sample. First, the sample of interest is prepared depending on its nature. For example, the preparation may involve grinding, homogenizing, or diluting. Next, the instrument is set up and the sample is placed inside the instrument for measurement.
after that the sample is exposed to em radiation and the interaction happens this interaction may absorb or scatter certain wavelengths depending upon the composition of the sample the intensity is then measured by the instrument and as a data is generated the data that is generated provides us with information about the composition and the structure of the spectrum after the procedure conclusions can be drawn based on the spectrum which is generated by the instrument here is a diagram which shows this process as we can see the apparatus includes a light source a wavelength selector a sample a detector and finally a computer the next one is chromatography a chromatography technique involves the separation of the components of a mixture based on their different affinities to a stationary phase and secondly a mobile phase gas chromatography and high performance liquid chromatography are commonly used in archaeochemistry and they are very helpful to identify organic compounds for example lipids dyes and residues the procedure involves the sample being prepared which is which can actually involve the use of a suitable solvent or extraction of the desired components from a more complex mixture and then a chromatographic column is prepared by setting it up with a stationary phase material which is actually a material that remains static during the process alumina and silica gel are very commonly used materials the sample is then injected into the column and it is introduced onto the stationary phase the mobile phase is then passed through the column and it carries the sample components through the column a mobile phase is actually a solvent or a mixture of solvents as the mobile phase travels through the column different components of the sample interact differently with the stationary phase the compounds that have stronger affinities move fastly while the compounds which have weaker affinities move slowly the components move through the column and they are gradually eluted which means to be removed and as they are eluted from the stationary phase by the mobile phase they form separate peaks in the chromatogram based on their retention time the retention time is basically the time which is taken by each of them to pass through the column the eluted components exit the column and then they pass through a detector which measures their concentration and it forms a chromatogram the chromatogram is analyzed to determine the identity and the quantity of the components which are present in the sample it involves a comparison of the retention times and the peak shapes with a specific reference data the conclusions are then made based on the analysis about the composition and the different characteristics of the sample which is being observed in this diagram as we can see the mobile phase lies on the top and the high affinity portion is above the low affinity portion and the components are being eluted from the column the third one is isotope analysis this process involves measuring stable or radioactive isotopes in archaeological materials the stable isotope analysis includes stable carbon isotope analysis stable nitrogen isotope analysis and stable oxygen isotope analysis this can provide information about diet migration patterns and paleoclimate of the ancient world paleoclimate is basically a climate of a past geological age next is radiocarbon dating which is actually based on radioactive decay of carbon 14 and it is widely used for dating organic material which is which would actually be explained in more details later on in the first part i will be talking about the procedure of stable isotope analysis Firstly the sample is prepared depending upon the specific element and isotope which is being targeted and this can involve grinding drying chemical digestion and extraction the sample is then subjected to an instrument which is called isotope radio mass spectrometer and this measures the isotopic ratios of the elements in the sample this instrument operates by ionizing the sample and it separates the ions based on their mass to charge ratios and measures their relative abundances For an accurate measurement of the ratios, reference standards with known isotopic ratios are also measured alongside the original sample, which actually acts as a control group to the actual experimental group, which is the sample under observation. The experimentally measured isotopic ratios in the sample are corrected using the reference ratios of the reference standard. Then the corrected ratios are compared to established databases, and the results are interpreted. 
These databases then provide us with information about various materials and various sources and lets researchers know more about the origin, diet, migration patterns, and the environmental conditions related to the sample. The next type of this procedure is radiocarbon dating. This is used to determine the age of organic materials based on the decay of carbon-14 isotope. Now I will be talking about how radiocarbon dating works. As we all know, living organisms absorb carbon-14 into their body tissues and when they die the absorption stops and the carbon-14 slowly begins to change into other atoms and it decays at a rate which is actually predictable. Scientists measure the remaining carbon-14 in the tissues and then they can predict how long the organism has been dead for. In this picture, as we can see, the animal is absorbing carbon-14 from the environment and when the animal is dead, the amount of carbon-14 has slowly changed from 100% to almost 12% after around 17,000 years. Now let me talk about the procedure. The archaeological sample which contains the organic material which can be wood, charcoal, bone and embalmed flesh or plant remains is collected. It is also important to take great care of the sample and to select a sample that is actually well preserved and represents a certain geological age. The pretreatment is done on the sample and the contaminants are removed so that we can have accurate results. It can involve washing, chemical cleaning, or physical separation. The organic material in the sample is then chemically treated to extract carbon in the form of either CO2 or graphite. This extracted carbon is then subjected to a sensitive instrument which is called accelerator mass spectrometer. This instrument is so accurate that it can even measure very low levels of carbon. The instrument measures the ratio of carbon-14 to the ratio of stable carbon isotopes in the sample and then the measured ratios are calibrated to amount for fluctuations or differences in the atmospheric levels of 14C over time. This is actually very important because the atmospheric levels have varied in past due to different factors like changes in solar activity and carbon cycle. Next, the calibrated carbon-14 ratio is used to determine the age of the sample. This is actually done by the comparison of measured ratio to the calibration curve which relates it to calendar years. The calculated age is then interpreted in archaeological context and this process provides us with valuable information about the chronology and the dating of an artifact or an archaeological site. Chronology is basically an order of events. Now let me introduce you to the limitations of radiocarbon dating. If the sample is older than 50,000 years, they are very hard to be dated and the reason behind this is that the carbon green levels diminish over time. A great care should also be taken and factors like sample contamination, environmental effects and specific calibration methods are to be considered. Now I will be showing some important artifacts. The sample is then placed in an instrument called mass spectrometer where it is ionized. The molecules of the sample are converted into ions by techniques like electron ionization and electrospray ionization. This is the picture of the oldest mummy discovered in excavations at Saqqara and it is nearly 4,300 years old. Excavations basically means to dig up ground in search of archaeological materials. This is the picture of a stromatolite, which are actually the oldest known fossils and they represent the beginning of life on Earth. And this one particular in the picture is actually 3.4 billion years old. Now the next technique is mass spectrometry, which involves the determination of elemental composition, isotopic ratios and molecular structure of various materials. The procedure involves preparation of the sample for the analysis. It can also include extraction, purification, or conversion to a different state, for example, a liquid state or a gas state. The generated ions are then accelerated in an electrical or magnetic field which separates them based on their mass to charge ratio. These separated ions are detected by a detector and this detector converts the ions into electrical signals and provides information about their mass and their quantity. The recorded mass spectrum represents the distribution of ions as a function of their ratios and it is analyzed using a very specialized software. An isotopic analysis is done by the measurement of relative abundances of different isotopes. 
in stable isotope ratios, for example, carbon-13 or nitrogen-15, it can provide, provide insights into diet, migration, or environmental conditions of ancient populations. In radiogenic isotopes, for example, strontium-87 or lead-206 can be used to trace the geographical origins of artifacts. This process provides us with information about the molecular structure and composition of organic compounds, high-resolution mass spectrometry, enables the identification of specific molecules, for example, lipids, proteins, and pigments in archaeological samples. Here is a diagram, and as we can see, the apparatus includes an electronic gun, accelerator plates, a magnet, a vacuum, and a detector. The sample is introduced in the, in the direction of the electron gun and accelerator plates. The fourth one is thermal analysis. This kind of techniques are used to study thermal properties and thermal behavior of archaeological materials. It is very helpful in understanding the manufacturing process, thermal alteration, and identification of organic and inorganic compounds. Two important types include differential scanning, calorimetry, and thermogravimetric analysis. Now I will be talking about its procedure. The sample is first prepared and this can involve cleaning and the removal of surface contaminants. It is also ensured that it is in a suitable form, for example, a powdered form, a solid form, or in a solution. The thermal analysis instrument is set up according to the technique which is being used. It can either be differential scanning calorimeter or a thermogravimetric analyzer. The sample is then placed in the instrument for measurement and the instrument applies controlled temperature changes to the sample while monitoring its physical or chemical properties which can actually be one property or more than one properties. In DSC, the heat difference between the sample and the reference material is measured as temperature is changed. It provides us with information about transitions, chemical reactions and heat capacity changes. Transitions can include melting or crystallization. In DGA, the change in mass of a sample is measured as the temperature is increased or decreased. It is very helpful in identifying thermal decomposition, volatilization, moisture content, and changes in weight. Next, the data is recorded by the instrument with a change in temperature. This record can be the corresponding changes in the specific measured property, for example, heat flow or mass, and usually the data is plotted as a function of time or temperature. Then this recorded data is analyzed to interpret the thermal behavior of the sample and it involves the identification of certain thermal events, for example, peaks, endothermic or exothermic transitions, loss of weight, or thermal stability ranges. The results of the analysis are very helpful in knowing the archaeological object's composition, its structure, or degradation processes. This information can also provide us with insights into the material properties, the manufacturing techniques, the alteration mechanisms, or the preservation conditions of the object. This process is also explained through this diagram where we can see that it, there are two different kinds of units, a computer unit and a detection unit. The sample is placed in the detection unit while the computer unit processes the data and controls the temperature. The next technique is microscopy. Microscopic techniques usually include scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy. Archaeological materials can be absorbed at a very high magnification with the use of microscopy. It helps us in identifying microstructure, surface features, and wear patterns on artifacts. And it also provides us with insights into manufacturing techniques, the use of tools, and the degradation processes the sample may have gone through. Now I will be talking about the procedure of microscopy. First of all, the material is prepared for the analysis. The sample is collected very carefully. It is cleaned, sometimes further processed by selection or polishing to obtain it in a very suitable form. The prepared sample is then placed in, inside the instrument. In SEM, a focused electron beam is used to scan the sample surface, while in TEM, an electron beam is passed through the sample. In SEM, the electron beam interacts with the sample surface and causes various interactions, for example, secondary electron emission, backscattered electron emission, and X-ray emission. In TEM, the electron beam passes through the sample and interactions like scattering and absorption happen. Both SEM and TEM produce very high resolution images and gives us great details and features at the micro scale or even nano scale. The images reveal the object's surface morphology, its texture, its microstructure, and sometimes 
elemental composition. This is dependent upon the detectors and the detection mode which is being used. Energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy can be used alongside with SEM or TEM and it enables the elemental analysis of the sample. It consists of detectors which can detect the characteristic X-rays which are emitted by the sample when they are bombarded with an electron beam. This provides us with information about the elemental composition and the distribution within the object. The high resolution images which are ob obtained with the microscopy gives us an insight into the microstructural features such as grain boundaries, crystal defects, phase boundaries and growth patterns. This information helps us in understanding the manufacturing techniques, the material properties and the potential alterations or degradation processes the archaeological object could possibly have gone through. Here is a picture which shows the examples of collagen classification in these four images in four different types. First one being slightly beaded, second beaded, third dumbbell and the fourth one is fibrous. All of these images have been generated by microscopes. And these were collected from East and these were collected for the purpose of understanding cooking at prehistoric feasting sites. The next one is X-ray diffraction. This process is used for the analysis of crystal structure of minerals and materials. In archaeochemistry, it can identify mineralogical composition, crystalline phases, and the presence of specific minerals in ceramics, pigments, and stone artifacts. The procedure involves the preparation of the sample for the analysis. The sample may also need cleaning, grinding, or crushing so that a representative powder form is obtained. The sample is then exposed to an X-ray beam in the instrument. The X-rays interact with the atoms in the sample and this causes diffraction. The angle and intensity of the diffracted X-rays are then measured by using a detector. The X-rays which have been diffracted produce a very unique diffraction pattern which represents the arrangement of atoms in the crystalline structure of the material. This pattern consists of a series of peaks that correspond to diffraction angles and intensities. The pattern is then compared with non-reference patterns in a database and identification of the mineral is done. The position and the intensities of the peaks are then matched to determine the crystalline structure and the mineral composition. The intensity of the peaks can provide us with information about the relative amounts or the proportions of different phases in the artifact. Quantitative analysis techniques such as Ritual refinement or peak fitting methods can also be applied to determine the quantitative mineralogical composition. This process can also provide us with information about the crystal structure, the lattice parameters and the symmetry of mineral phases. And this information can also be used to identify specific polymorphs or variations within a mineral species. Polymorphs which are actually the different forms of the same substance and these can have implications for the origin, production techniques or alteration processes of the artifact. As we can see in this picture, the X-ray beam is passed and then it is diffused through the mineral and the image is produced such that each dot on the plate represents the position of one singular atom. Now I will be talking about the materials which are studied in archaeochemistry. Different types of materials are studied in this subject and it provides us with insights into human history, culture and technological development and I would be talking about the important materials. The first one being ceramics. Pottery and ceramic artifacts, for example vessels, figurines and tiles provide us with information about ancient manufacturing techniques, the trade networks, the social practices and the cultural traditions. This is a picture of a ceramic vessel which was made by Taino people and it was discovered in Haiti and it has been dated to around 1200 to 1500 AD. The second important material is metals. Archaeological metals include copper, bronze, iron, gold and silver. These objects give us insights into the metalworking technology, the craftsmanship, the trade and economic systems as well as the social hierarchies of ancient world. This is a picture of an iron weapon which was made in the Iron Age and it was discovered in Hordaland County and it is around 1000 years old. This is a picture of one of the silver coins which were discovered on a German island and they were made in the era of the Viking ruler Harald and it is around 1000 years old. 
The next material is stones. Stone tools, sculptures and structures provide us with evidences of ancient tool production, ancient craftsmanship, architecture and construction techniques. They also shed light on subsistence practices and the symbolic aspects of old societies. This is a picture of plate-like tools and teeth pendants which were discovered in Bastrokiro cave and it is around 45,000 years old. The next in the list is organic materials. Organic materials like wood, textile, leather, bone, and plant remains provide us with information about ancient technologies, craftsmanship, diet, clothing, trade, and environmental conditions. This is a picture of the oldest known leather shoe which was discovered in a cave in Armenia and it is around 5,500 years old. The second picture is a fossil of the oldest example of flowering bud and its scientific name is Florigerminis jurassica. It was discovered in Mongolia and it is around 164 million years old. The next important material is glass. Archaeological glass objects such as beads, vessels and ornaments reveal ancient glass production techniques, ancient craftsmanship, ancient trade networks and their cultural practices. This is a picture of glass vessels which were discovered in Bureau and it is around 1500 years old. The next important material is faunal remains. Animal bones and remains found at archaeological sites help reconstruct past environments and construct subsistence strategies, hunting practices, animal domestication, and human animal interactions. This is a picture of a baboon skull which was discovered in East Africa and it is around 3,300 years old. The next one is ecofacts. Ecofacts include plant remains, pollen, seeds, and charcoal, which provide information about ancient vegetation, diet, cultural practices, climate, and environmental changes. This is a picture of carbonized seeds, which were discovered from Horizon 3 Kharib Hof, and it is around 37,000 years old. The next one is rock art. Petroglyphs, pictographs, and other forms of rock art provide us with insights into ancient belief systems, ancient mythology, social structures, and cultural expressions. The difference between petroglyphs and pictographs is that petroglyphs are actually carved into the rock, while pictographs only include painting on the surface. This is a picture of a pocket-sized rock art which is probably showing a sun, a flower, or an eye and it was discovered in Indonesia. It is probably carbon dated to around 20,000 years old. The next important material is architectural remains. Architectural elements, for example, bricks, tiles, plaster, and building foundations provide us with information about the ancient construction techniques, the urban planning, and architectural styles. This is a picture of an antique Jewish Hebrew tile which was discovered in Fes, Morocco and it is around 210 years old. When these materials are studied together with archaeological context and other techniques, it really helps archaeologists to reconstruct past societies, technological advancements, cultural practices, and the interactions between humans and their environment. Now I will be talking about the chemical characterization of artifacts. Chemical analysis have a very important role in determining the composition of artifacts and these involve various techniques which are used by researchers to identify elements, isotopes and the compounds which are present in the samples. Now I will be talking about how chemical analysis is used in archaeology. First of all, elemental analysis. In this type of analysis, techniques like axial fluorescence and mass spectrometry are used to determine the elemental composition of archaeological materials. These methods identify and quantify the concentration of different elements which are present in a sample and this provides us with insights into the types of metals, minerals and other components present in a sample. The second one is isotopic analysis. As we talked earlier, it helps us determine the isotopic composition of certain elements and it is of two types the stable isotope analysis and radiogenic isotopes and the stable one reveals information about past diet, migration, climate and environmental conditions while radiogenic are used for carbon dating. The third one is molecular analysis in which chemical analysis techniques like mass spectrometry is used and it helps in the identification and characterization of organic compounds. It also helps in the study of ancient residues like lipids, dyes and pigments or organic binders which are used in paintings, cosmetics or food production. The fourth one is microchemical analysis. It includes techniques like microscopy and X-ray spectroscopy and it allows a localized observation and analysis of small areas of a sample. 
It also helps in identifying the composition of elements, surface coatings, or patinas. It also helps us in understanding the technological processes or material alterations. This is a picture which shows what a patina is. It is actually a green or brown film which is produced on a metal over a long period of time due to oxidation. The fifth one is residue analysis. It involves extracting and analyzing trace amounts of organic or inorganic materials which are left on artifacts. It can provide us details of past food processing, plant use, cosmetic practices, or the presence of specific substances which are used for cultural or ritual purposes. The sixth one is thermal analysis. Thermal analysis techniques help us study the thermal properties, decomposition, and phase changes of the material. It helps us in understanding the manufacturing processes, material stability, or alterations over time. By using these and other chemical analysis techniques, archaeologists can have valuable information about archaeological materials, and chemical analysis enhances our understanding of ancient societies, their technologies, their economic system, and interactions with the environment. Now I will be talking about identification of manufacturing techniques. Archaeochemistry has a very important role in identifying the manufacturing techniques used in the production of archaeological materials by analyzing the chemical composition, the microstructure and material properties of artifacts. Researchers can have insights into the processes employed by ancient cultures. Now I will be talking about some ways archaeochemistry helps us identify the manufacturing techniques. The first one is elemental composition. Chemical analysis techniques determine the elemental composition of artifacts and it allows researchers to identify the raw materials used and trace their geographical origins. Variations in elemental composition can indicate differences in production techniques. The second one is microstructural analysis. It allows the study of microstructure of archaeological materials. Manufacturing techniques of the past leave characteristic microstructural features like grain size, distribution, and orientation. This kind of observations help us to identify the methods which were used in the shaping, forming, or processing of these materials. Third one is phase analysis. Phase identification methods help us to determine the crystalline phases present in artifacts. Different manufacturing techniques often result in distinct crystal structures. For example, different firing or tempering methods in pottery production will lead to specific mineral phases or clay transformations, and this aids in the identification of ceramic production techniques. Fourth one is sulfur coatings and patinas. Chemical analysis techniques are very helpful to identify surface coatings, Korean products, or patinas on artifacts as we discussed earlier. These features can reveal the application of protective or decorative coatings, the use of specific materials for surface treatment, or the formation of Korean layers with the passage of time. The fifth one is residue analysis. It involves the extraction and analysis of trace amounts of organic or inorganic materials on artifacts. It can also provide insights into specific manufacturing techniques, for example, the presence of tool marks, adhesives, pigments, or other substances which were used during the process of production. The sixth one is experimental replication. By reproducing ancient manufacturing techniques with the use of similar raw materials, tools, and conditions, researchers can compare the resulting artifacts with archaeological finds. This helps with the validation of our hypothesis. We would actually be talking about a case study which involves this kind of procedure later on. With a combination of these approaches, researchers can identify characteristic signatures, markers, or patterns associated with specific manufacturing techniques. This knowledge enhances our understanding of ancient craftsmanship, ancient technology, old cultural practices, and the evolution of material production with the passage of time. Now I will be talking about some important examples of successful identifications of old manufacturing techniques which were used by ancient people. The first one is papyrus making in Egypt. Papyrus basically means a type of paper, uh, a type of ancient paper as well as the plant which was used to make that paper. The earliest known roll of papyrus has been carbon dated back to around 2900 before Christ and it was discovered in Egypt. Papyrus was used as a writing surface in various cultures throughout history. The papyrus plant, which is actually Cyprus papyrus, grew along the Nile River and it was commonly used for making paper. 
the sheets were actually made from white pages inside the stock and it had crisscross patterns which were formed by the layers of pages slices perpendicularly the method of uh, making papyrus is not completely known but it involved cutting and strapping the stock then creating types of pages and layering them to form sheets the sheets were then used to make rolls and written scripts and illustrations were made on those sheets these rolls were written on by using black and red inks and the colors of these inks were made from natural pigments today the preservation and appearance of papyrus rolls are influenced by factors like aging burial environment preservation methods and exposure to light depending on these challenges well preserved papyri can provide great details and information about the ancient civilization here is a picture of ancient egyptians making paper through the process of papyrus making and the second one is a papyrus the second one is prehistoric manufacturing techniques The manufacturing technique of prehistoric societies included grinding corn, baking clay, spinning and weaving textiles, and then dyeing, fermenting, and distilling. The metalwork skills for extraction or working of metals like gold, silver, copper, and tin were also developing in the people, and we know about these techniques through archaeological findings and archaeological evidences. Excavations, which means to basically dig the ground for archaeological evidences, have uncovered tools and artifacts related to these processes. for example grinding stones pottery cans textile fragments and metal objects as well as remnants of dyes and fermentation vessels had provided archaeologists with insights into the techniques which were employed to create them moreover the widespread distribution of certain materials such as flint arrowheads also suggests the existence of trade networks and transmission of manufacturing expertise between different societies The study of these objects and their context lets researchers know and reconstruct and understand the manufacturing techniques of ancient societies. The hand axes in Stone Age were made by a process which is called flint napping. Flint is a type of hard and fine grained stone and it was a very popular material which was used to make hand axes. The process of making a hand axe included carefully striking a large flint core with a harder rock to remove the flakes and then shape it to a desired form. As we can see in this picture where a flint rock is being carved to create a hand axe. Archaeologists have discovered many hand axes from the Stone Age which provided physical evidence of the manufacturing techniques which were used. By studying these artifacts and the patterns of flake removal, archaeologists had made conclusions about the skill and the craftsmanship of ancient people and how good they were at making hand axes. Here are two archaeological finds related to this topic. The third example is ceramic shaping. Archaeologists used imaging methods to study the shaping techniques in ceramics and they examined the orientation of features of the ceramic body to identify different shaping techniques. The methods that were used were radiography, microscopy and photograph and the different cross sections of the objects were analyzed. The experimental studies involved creating bowls using various techniques like coiling and pinching and different types of clay combinations were tested in the experiments. The vessels were then made to dry and then through the methods researchers learned a lot about the shaping techniques of ancient humans which is an employment of a technique that I mentioned earlier that is experimental replication. This is a picture of the ceramic bowl which was used for experimental purposes. The fourth one is glass making. Glass has been used since ancient times and obsidian was a very well known by natural glass since ancient times and its specific and the specific origins of glass production are uncertain but it was already in use around the 14th century before Christ. Egyptians used glass like materials like beads before the actual glass was even made. Making decorative glass was very complex and rare and it involved special chemistry and shaping techniques. The discovery of faience which is a quartz sand and alkaline which mixture covered with clays preceded with the process of glass production. The core forming technique revolutionized the process of glass making and it lasted for around over a thousand years. Glass objects were actually initially very expensive but with the invention of glass blowing tubes in the 1st century before Christ the glassware was made more affordable. Romans played a very significant role in spreading glass production through their workshops in different regions. Here is a picture of obsidian which is an artifact preserved in a US museum. This is a picture of an ancient Roman factory where glass blowing is being done since the Roman times. The artist of this picture is unknown. 
this is another picture which she was glass making in england in the 17th century and again the artist of this picture is also unknown now i will be talking about the use of chemistry in the preservation and the conversation of artifacts chemistry is a very important role in the in preserving and conserving archaeological materials and now i would mention the important ways in which it is used the first one is cleaning and stabilization Chemical techniques are used to clean artifacts and stabilize them for long-term preservation. It involves to remove dirt, corrosion, or other contaminants from the surface of the objects, and chemical stabilizers are used so that further deterioration of the materials can be prevented. Like metals deteriorate by inhibiting oxidation or acid formation, so different methods would be used to prevent it. The second one is documentation and analysis. Chemistry is used for the analysis and documentation of archaeological materials. Different techniques include spectroscopy, chromatography, and microscopy, and they help in the identification of the composition, structure, and the condition of artifacts. And then this information guides our archaeologists to make decisions to properly conserve the objects. The third one is preventing degradation. Chemical treatments are used to pro prevent or to slow down the degradation processes after archaeological materials have been discovered in order to conserve them. For example, materials which are vulnerable to hydrolysis such as parchment or leather, it can be treated with substances like magnesium bicarbonate to neutralize the acidic degradation products. The fourth one is environmental control. Chemistry helps us in controlling the environment, surrounding the archaeological materials to prevent their deterioration. It can involve monitoring and regulating factors like temperature, humidity, light exposure, and pollutant levels. And then chemical sensors and indicators are also used to know about the surrounding environments so that further decisions can be taken. The fifth one is material consolidation and restoration. Chemicals are used to consolidate fragile or deteriorated materials like crumbling ceramics or flaking paint layers. Adhesives and fillers are carefully selected and used to stabilize the material and prevent its further damage. Chemistry is also implied in the restoration of damaged or fragmented objects to construct them to their original form. Here is a picture of a scientist consolidating a clay artifact so that it can be conserved. I will be talking about the innovative preservation and conservation treatments with the application of chemistry. The first one is desalination. This treatment is used for artifacts that have been exposed to salt water or that have salt deposits because of being buried into saline environments, which means salty environments. This technique involves the use of chemical solutions to remove salt ions from the object and prevents further deterioration caused by salt crystallization. The second one is freeze drying. This technique is a preservation method that involves freezing an artifact and then the ice is removed through sublimation. Sublimation is basically the conversion of a solid directly to a gas form, skipping the liquid state. This technique is particularly useful for waterlogged or fragile organic materials, for example wood or textiles and it helps to retain the structure and prevent the decay of these objects. The third one is nanomaterials. Nanomaterials like nanoparticles or nanostructured coatings can be applied to protect surfaces to enhance their integrity and to provide a barrier against environmental factors like moisture, UV radiation, or pollution. And these materials can then be applied through various techniques like spraying or immersion. In spraying, the nanomaterial is applied by spraying it to the artifact, whereas in immersion, the object is immersed into the nanomaterial. The fourth one is protective coatings. Advanced coatings and films can be applied to artifacts to create a protective barrier against degradation factors like Korean inhibitors can be used to prevent the oxidation of metals and microencapsulation involves applying a protective coating to any object so that its deterioration can be prevented. The fifth one is non-toxic insecticide. Research is currently focused on developing insecticides that are non-toxic that do not damage the artifact and also keeps insects away from it. And it uh, includes the use of natural products like essential oils or plant extracts which can exhibit insect repellent properties. Continued research in and development in this field holds the promise of further advancements in the field of artifact conservation techniques. Now I will be mentioning important case studies related to the investigation of the trade and exchange of materials in the ancient world. The first one is revealing trade patterns of ancient pottery by chemical analysis. 
This study was basically conducted by researchers from the University of Bristol and it was published in the journal PLOS1. This study used chemical analysis techniques to examine pottery samples from different regions and by analyzing the elemental and isotopic composition of the pottery, the researchers were able to trace the movement of pottery and identify the trade and exchange patterns of ancient times. Now I would move towards its research outcome. The research was focused on the analysis of food residues in ancient Egyptian pottery and researchers used organic residue analysis and stable carbon isotope analysis to investigate the food and beverage contents that had been stored in these vessels by detecting specific biomarkers which is actually an indicator used to identify a biological substance and carbon isotopic signatures, the study provided insights into the ancient Egyptian diet and it revealed information about the consumption of animal products, plant based foods and trade patterns during that time. The second one is revealing ancient trade routes and exchange networks by chemical traces. This research was led by a team of scientists from the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History and it employed chemical analysis methods to investigate the trade and exchange of obsidian, which I mentioned earlier, in the Mediterranean region during the Neolithic period. By analyzing the trace elements in obsidian samples from different archaeological sites, researchers were able to identify the geological sources of the obsidian and they reconstructed the trade routes and networks through which it had been distributed in the past. The main outcome of this research revealed the extensive long-distance trade routes and exchange networks which highlighted the importance of obsidian as a valuable raw material in the old societies and provided us with information on the ancient trade and cultural interactions. Now I would move towards the second part of the case studies which is about the use of chemical analysis to investigate the study of technology in the ancient world. The first one is revealing technological advancements of ancient materials by chemical analysis. This study was conducted by researchers from the University of Cambridge and it was published in the journal Nature Communications. This study utilized the chemical analysis techniques to examine ancient metal artifacts and by the analysis of the elemental composition and isotopic ratio of metals, researchers were able to gain insights into the ancient metalworking techniques, the technological advancements and even identify sources of raw materials used in metal production. The outcome of the research was the revelation that the copper used in the artifacts was sourced from multiple lo locations and it suggested complex trade networks during the Bronze Age. The findings provided insights into technological and cultural connections between different ancient societies and the significance of metal trade in shaping ancient economies. The second one is revealing ancient ceramic technology by chemical analysis. This research was carried out by a team of scientists from the University of Exeter and it was published in the journal Archaeometry. This research was focused on the chemical analysis of ancient ceramics to understand the ancient ceramic technology. This study employed techniques like scanning electron microscopy to analyze the elemental composition, mineralogy and microstructure of certain samples. By studying these characteristics, researchers gained a lot of insight into ceramic production techniques, the raw material sourcing and the technological developments in ancient world. The main outcome of this research was the identification of organic residues found in pottery vessels from prehistoric sites. It also provided insights into the types of food and beverages that were stored and consumed in the vessels. This research also shed light on ancient dietary practices and food processing techniques and it also enhanced our understanding of ancient cultures and their relationship with food. Now I will be moving towards the third part of the case studies which is the use of chemical analysis to investigate the identification of food in ancient pottery. The first one is revealing ancient cuisine by chemical analysis of residues. This study was conducted by a team of researchers from the University of Bristol and it was published in the journal Nature. This study used a chemical analysis technique which combined gas chromatography mass spectrometry and liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. It analyzed the residues found in ancient pottery vessels and by identifying specific biomarkers and organic compounds present in the residues, the researchers were able to gain insights into the type of foods and beverages that were previously stored or prepared in the pottery, provided us with valuable information about ancient cuisine and dietary practices. 
The main outcome of this research was basically the revelation of the variations in elemental composition of pottery vessels and provided us with valuable information about the raw materials used and the important trade patterns in ancient societies. This research also helped us understand the production techniques, the resource availability and the cultural interactions of past societies by the analysis of these vessels. The second one is revealing traces of wine in ancient ceramic vessels by chemical analysis. This research was conducted by scientists from the University of Pennsylvania and it was published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This research focused on the chemical analysis of ceramic vessels to detect traces of ancient wine. The researchers employed techniques like tandem mass spectrometry and they analyzed organic compounds present in the pottery residues. By identifying the specific markers associated with wine such as tartaric acid, it provided with the evidence for the production and consumption of wine in ancient cultures. Now I would move towards the outcome of this research. This study examined the proteins and the DNA present in the rental calculus from ancient individuals. The results provided insights into the dietary habits, survivable interactions, and genetic relationships of past populations, and it also informed scientists on the ancient human lifestyle, their food choices, and their interactions with oral microbiota, which is actually the diverse microbes found in the human oral cavity. It also contributed to our understanding of human history and human evolution. Now I will be moving towards the challenges which are provided by the study of artifacts. The first one being preservation. Archaeological materials are basically fragile and they are more prone to decay as well as environmental factors like humidity, temperature and exposure to light are also very challenging. The second one is fragmentation and loss. Archaeological materials are usually discovered in fragmented or incomplete states and it is very challenging to piece together and reconstruct the whole object. The third one is interpretation. Archaeological materials often lack accompanying written record, then the procedure has to be relied upon various techniques for knowing the context. Now I will be talking about the opportunities which are provided by the study of artifacts. The first one being scientific advances. This field provides great opportunities and it also provides insights into past civilization. The second one is multidisciplinary approach. This field involves collaborations and it brings together different perspectives and different approaches of different subjects. The third one is cultural heritage conservation. This field contributes to the preservation and the conservation of archaeological materials and it also raises awareness about production of heritage for our coming generations. Now I will be mentioning the sources that I gained this information from. These links or these QR codes can be used to access the material. Thank you so much for watching my video presentation. I hope that you liked it and gained some useful information from this video. Make sure to like, comment and subscribe to the channel below. Thank you very much.